to get started. Um, thanks for those that are joining online. Got, I can find my mouse at all. Uh, we got yeah, a couple of people online uh, here and a couple of us here in the room to enjoy some uh, cookies that I brought in for us. Um, I, I think again we're we're just a box a box of uh, cookies per person here, including myself. So, um, so yeah. But thanks everybody for joining us. Otherwise, uh, just figure uh, to first uh, introduce the uh, since the start of the semester and the Space of ET uh, seminar series. Um, this is our Space BT website and information uh, that there's a little bit of you can find here, including the YouTube channel. Um, this will go up uh, hopefully in the next week or so. I'll have to see how my schedule uh, starts working out. But you can start to see uh, when we have uh, other upcoming seminars here. Uh, without uh, much more ado, um, go ahead and, yeah, and share your screen. Perfect. Um, so here. <laughs> see, I think I'm sharing my screen now. Yeah. Oh, I see, but it's 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 inverted. Okay, there we there we go. All right, awesome. All right. Uh, well, without further ado, I guess I'll get started. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, so my name is uh, Richard Gibbons. I'm a direct PhD student uh, in the ECE department. Uh, I head up the electronics development for uh, OOP ProSat 1, uh, which is uh, a student-led 3U CubeSat mission uh, that we're planning on launching here in February and Mo March. Um, I'm going to be presenting on the electronics design for an independent payload control module uh, for boom, boom deployment mechanisms. Um, so, of course, a special thank you to our sponsors and stakeholders, uh, NASA, Virginia Tech, Penn State. Um, and, of course, a special thank you to my advisor, uh, Dr. Jonathan Black, uh, for his uh, wisdom and uh, expertise uh, on these kinds of engineering projects. So, for a bit of background. Um, so, again, UPROSAT is a 3U CubeSat mission, and so we are running uh, three different payload experiments. Um, so payload one is a boom deployment mechanism. So this is an arm that just extends out from the spacecraft. Uh, it'll have an inertial measurement unit on the end of it to actually measure what the vibrations are of the arm. Um, payload two is going to be an S-band radio. This is just to test, uh, to do a basic test of S-band communications with the Virginia Tech ground station. Uh, and then payload three, which is uh, my personal favorite, is actually a test of Optane memory, um, which is actually a test of uh, Intel's Optane memory uh, in the space environment. And so the goal for my team was to design a computer uh, to run all these payload experiments and to store the results. Um, so that when we do passes around the ground station, we can downlink those results. And so you can see here is just the slide on the boom deployment mechanism. Uh, so this is designed by the mechanical team. So it's a so the boom itself is just a tape spring um, that extends out and retracts. So I think it's a passive extension and then a uh, active retraction with a stepper motor. Um, and so this deployment mechanism required I think two a stepper motor, two servos. Uh, and some other sensors to actually get feedback on the position. Um, and so just kind of moving into the design requirements. So here on the right, you can actually see an image of the payload control module board that my team designed uh, being powered up. So these little blue LEDs that are shining indicate board has three volts and five volts. Um, but to, so that was just a little aside, to go back to the design requirements, um, so the initial, so the design requirements that were presented to the team were that in the environment, this is like a 200, 300 kilometer altitude mission. Um, so this actually goes below the ISS and the maximum lifetime of the mission is nine days. Uh, so that actually provided us a lot of flexibility with um, selecting different components and component sourcing given a chip shortage. Uh, and so the payload one electrical devices that uh, are needed in order to actually get uh, payload one working are a stepper motor, uh, two servos to drive a clutch mechanism along with an encoder to give back a feedback position uh, and an external camera uh, to provide a visual check uh, to verify that, okay, we have uh, extended the arm all the way out from the spacecraft. And then payloads two and three are just providing a, uh, so payload two is just a serial CAN connection with the S-band radio module. Uh, and then payload three is just a USB 2.0 connection 
uh, that runs off to a separate board that actually houses our Optane memory. Um, and so given those design requirements, uh, pretty much this is our system block diagram um, that my team came up with. This is just a high level at like, you know, what the architecture actually looks like for the board, um, what circuits we have on it and how they're communicating with the main microcontroller unit. Um, so we have three BMI 270 inertial measurement units. Uh, I'll talk more about the design selection for that later. Uh, a micro SD card slot, uh, it has a micro SD card for long-term memory storage, uh, an STM32 F4, 29 ZIT6, that's just a microcontroller unit that we know has flown in the space environment before. Uh, and we have a lot of experience with prior, you know, just like developing code for and whatnot. Um, and then we have an IR temperature camera along with uh, a UART that goes back to the avionics. Um, so on the electrical side for the spacecraft overall, we decided to abstract, uh, at least for my team, uh, abstract out the avionics. Uh, so the avionics is just going to be held by software since uh, there were we're just procuring the uh, different parts of the bus for that. Um, and all we had to do was just uh, make sure that we could communicate with the bus uh, and send packets and whatnot over UART. Uh, and then of course the USB 2.0 line for the Optane memory uh, and then the L298P stepper motor controller. That's basically just uh, an H bridge. And I'll talk more about that uh, on the next slide here. Um, so yeah, so moving on to the payload one electronics. Uh, so here, uh, so pretty much for schematic capture, the PCB design, we actually decided to go with KiCad uh, just because it was open source. Uh, we can map all of our data sheets to the symbols relatively easily. Um, and we wanted other people to actually, uh, in the open source community, actually take this uh, and actually expand upon it um, to, to show like, you know, hey, electronics is not as, you know, uh, bad as people think it is. Uh, and so that's what you're going to see here for the next couple of slides. Uh, so... This just covers the uh, stepper motor driver electronics. Uh, so we just have some uh, diodes here on the outputs of uh, the stepper motor driver to act as voltage clamps, so that this way we don't uh, over so that this way we don't overdraw from the main battery bus voltage. Um, and then we also added just test points on the power lines to make sure that okay we're getting reliable power. Uh, and this stepper motor chip itself is just an H bridge. Um, and so for that, you just think of it as like four switches that turn on and off. And depending on how you turn them on and off, uh, you can actually drive the coils inside the stepper motor to actually get it to rotate. Um, and then on the output, we have, and also on the output, we have some current sensing as well. So this way we can te detect overheating uh, in the stepper motor when we're in space. And so then this is our current sense amplifier design. Uh, nothing too crazy complicated here. Uh, we just used a non-inverting amplifier to take the small uh, current set signal coming from the LTN8 chip um, and just uh, basically apply gain to that to um, multiply that signal uh, so that we can use the full uh, dynamic range of the ADC input on the STM32. Um, and we just made uh, the resistors for the feedback um, just like a jumper and, de and a do not insert. Um, because it's the same footprint on the board. We can just go in and we can just add uh, whatever resistors we want as long as it's a certain given package. Uh, and then also we added voltage dividers on the output as well in case we needed to just sort of step down uh, the voltage sig that signal coming from the LT98 chip. Uh, so for a little bit of background on this design. So this is uh, basically the logic level shifters. Uh, so one of the issues that my team encountered was that the STM32 microcontroller uses 3.3 volt logic, um, but the L298 stepper motor chip that we had selected uses 5 volt logic. Um, so it's just trying to figure out how do we convert a 3.3 volt signal to a 5 volt signal, and that's what the circuit does here. Um, so it's just using n-channel MOSFETs. Uh, one side is pulled up high to 3.3, the other is pulled up high to 5 volts. Um, if both sides are high, the MOSFET doesn't connect and we're okay. Um, but if either side actually uh, goes down to zero volts, right, for the logic signal, um, then the volt gate source, and then the gate source voltage on the MOSFET actually goes positive, and then the uh, MOSFET actually conducts and pulls both sides of the logic signal down to ground. Um, so that this way, we can actually get that level conversion um, without uh, worrying about overdriving the uh, the inputs of the uh, microcontroller unit. 
Uh, and then here is just the schematics for the uh, for the STM32F4 uh, microcontroller. So we just add an oscillator circuit, a JTAG connector to actually flash code to the microcontroller unit. Um, and then of course a decoupling capacitors here to make sure that the voltage was um, smooth as possible. Uh, and we also added test points to that as well to make sure that, okay, we're getting reliable 3.3 volts of the reference voltage. Um, and yeah, I think that's it for the electronics or at least for payload one. Um, and then of course, some other electronics is the SD card. Um, so it's just, uses the dedicated SDIO interface on the STM32. Um, it's just going to serve as like the long-term memory. So that's where we're going to store the results of these experiments. So like the data that we get um, from the boom deployment mechanism, like extending and retracting when that occurred, along with like uh, basically bit flip tests for the Optane memory um, uh, so that we can store it and you know downlink it later when the satellite comes back into uh, link with the ground station. Yeah, and so we also just added temperature monitoring circuits as well. So basically, it's just a thermistor uh, used in a voltage divider. This feeds into a voltage follower uh, to provide isolation from the MCU. Uh, and then this way, on the code side, we can basically map the uh, voltage drop across the cement thermistor to an actual temperature. Um, we wanted to add these onto the circuit so that when we were in the space, we were in space, we could monitor like uh, what's the temperature of the MCU and the stepper motor. Are they getting too hot, too cold? Um, uh, what's going on there so basically this is just sort of like our risk mitigation strategy if you wanted to use the systems engineering uh term uh to make sure that um the board wasn't heating up too much or you know getting too cold yeah and so then uh so we all so this board also comes with uh three inertial measurement units on it uh the, so we needed uh, an inertial measurement unit on the board itself to provide a reference uh for the imu data uh because the IMU on the tip of the boom is moving with the spacecraft and so we needed a reference to actually figure out like what was vibration versus what was full range of movement for the arm um and we decided to go with uh three inertial measurement units um uh, with a voting algorithm uh to implement what we call a single fault redundancy basically the idea there is you have if you have one sensor I can't tell if the data is accurate or not from that. Uh, so then I add a second sensor to try and uh, get a better estimate, but it still doesn't quite work because I can't tell which one is which if one of the values is just wildly off. So then I add a third one in there uh, to say, okay, I see that these two are accurate. These two are close together. This one is wildly off. This is the sensor that has failed. And so I'm just gonna read from the other two. And so this way we can lose a sensor and then still meet the minimum success criteria for payload one. Um, and so we decided to go with a, a BMI 270 from Bosch. Uh, the main reason for this was like, it's a good automotive quality, it's accurate, uh, and it was what was available to us, um, you know, during the chip shortages. Uh, it was just what we could find. So we, we implemented it on board. Uh, and then on to the PCB. Uh, so we'll talk briefly about this. So we decided to go with like a four layer PCB stack up. Um, so, using a, so using a top and bottom as the primary signal layers, and then for the internal layers, just using a ground plane along with a uh, power, along with two power planes. Um, and so, you know, our trace width is like, you know, what we call like, you know, power signals. So these are signals are probably gonna be higher current um, and you're gonna need to widen the tra trace width more uh, to increase the current carrying capacity of it. Um, so for the power, uh, we usually just do like power planes with a copper fill or just a 0 0.4 millimeter trace width. Um, and then for signal, we just kept it as small as possible at 2.5 millimeters. Um, this gave us, uh, basically uh, allowed us to take up less real estate on the board, which just made the routing a lot easier. Um, and then for the sectioning of the board, if you look at it closely, you can see on the top left-hand corner uh, of the board. So looking at the red image here, uh, at the top left, you can see that there's the stepper motor driver electronics. We wanted to, um, since those electronics were what we considered high current, uh, relative to the digital electronics over here, we wanted to do a little bit of isolation between the two. So this way we didn't have uh, noise issues creeping in from the stepper motor uh, to like the microcontroller and the more sensitive digital electronics. Um, and then 3.3 uh, volt actually surrounding, uh, pretty going around on that third layer. Uh, and then with the five volt copper plane uh, just underneath the, um, uh, the stepper motor driver for that five volt logic. 
Uh, and actually the thing that really helped us out like during this whole design process, so going from schematic, so going from schematic capture to the PCB design, uh, is that we actually used a, a software called CADLAB.io. It's like a visual version control software. So we can actually see if an engineer placed a resistor on the schematic or removed it, uh, or we can see that, oh, this trace was added instead of this. Um, and this way, we could start multiple branches and actually implement some version control uh, with the ultimate goal that, you know, um, for future space at BT projects that are going to design hardware, uh, you can have multiple engineers on your project just all converging together uh, on one product. And then, yeah, and then so for the actual uh, assembly process, uh, so you can see here on the left is just a, uh, it's just the board again, uh, next to a porter for the reference size. Um, these PC 104 boards are actually pretty small. Um, and so our general process, at least for test for getting the uh, first prototype was to just get an unpopulated PCB or printed circuit board uh, from a fabrication company. Um, so we get that in house and then I actually use the resources of one of the labs here at tech. Uh, to actually go through, use a stencil printer and apply a solder paste, and then I just populated the components myself by hand. Uh, and then we just placed it in uh, an oven to actually uh, heat the board, so that this way you could activate the solder, which acts as like the glue that binds the electronics together um, and turns it into a solid metal. Uh, and then if there are any problems after that process, I just uh, went through and corrected those issues by hand with the equipment that I had. Um, and I think for the final version of the board, once we are uh, complete with the prototyping stage, uh, we're just going to have, we're just going to mail in our parts and those PCBs and just have it assembled uh, by a manufacturing company. Yeah, and so then uh, this is just, uh, so here on the right here, we have uh, pretty much a picture of our board hooked up to a breadboard and some other electronics for testing, uh, flashing code. So our general testing procedure has always been to do like sequential testing because um, I've seen this happen with the senior design and the other students uh, and of course even some projects is that you get a team together, they go through and they build a whole bunch of stuff, but then they encounter like 20 errors because they didn't, you have to isolate those individual components so that this way you can figure out where your sources of error are coming from. And so that's kind of been our testing process for the board. So once we had the board assembled, the first test was going to be to just power on the board and see if we were getting reliable power. So that was going through with an oscilloscope and actually probing different parts of the board to make sure that, oh, we're getting a reliable 3.3 volts at these pins on the microcontroller unit. Oh, we're getting a stable five volts for the stepper motor. Um, and also making sure that, hey, the LEDs actually turn on, great. Um, and then the second test was just going to be a flash test. So this is where someone from the software team uh, would actually wire up um, pretty much the uh, flash programmer with the uh, board itself. And then it would just do a basic, uh, simple code to see if you can actually link up with the computer and then uh, actually change a value in one of the registers in the microcontroller unit. Uh, and this just proved to be the most simple test to say, hey, now we can actually flash code to the board. Um, and then after that, it was just sequential testing of like the supporting circuitry for payloads one, two, and three. So it was like, okay, can we read from the uh, encoder pin? Great. Can we uh, actually get an output from the stepper motor? Great. Do we get a UART out connection for the avionics? Great. It was just going through one by one and testing these things, starting with payload one, which is our highest priority, uh, as that's just how we define the minimum success criteria for the mission, and then moving on to payloads two and three. Um, and then the final test is just going to be overall integration with the spacecraft bus. So that's where we're actually going to take the board. We're going to stick it in with, with the satellite bus and all the other electronics. And we're just going to test communication with the onboard controller uh, and just do a basic power check with the electric power supply to make sure that we're getting the reliable 3.3 volt, 5 volt, and battery bus voltage from there. Uh, and then just some lessons learned uh, from going through and developing the electronics of the team. So the first board never works. Uh, if you're ever going to go through and develop your own hardware, expect that right from the beginning. That's why you always plan for two or more revisions uh, of your board. Sometimes you make a mistake and forget, oh, uh, I screwed up a footprint here. Or, oh, I need to add test points or, oh, I need to add this. Um, it's little cosmetic things that always get you in the development of these things. So you always want to like adjust your cost or your budget uh, to basically build two or three versions of the board. Um, and so adding uh, little PC test points to the board also really helped as well. So that this way we could actually uh, take like the IC hooks from the oscilloscope and just 
clip it on and then we can just turn it on and uh, power everything up. Uh, or we can see that uh, we have a little bit of ringing on the 3.3 volt line. And so then that would tell us to go back and make some changes. And then once you're done with the board, you can just remove those footprints or just leave the test points unpopulated. Uh, and then other little things like uh, triple check all of your footprint and symbol assignments. Um, so it's just making sure that you have the right footprint for a given package on your component. Um, we actually had a mistake where we used the wrong package for the stepper motor. And so we had to go back and do a revision of the board and get it ordered. And that, that, takes, that took some time. Um, and then the big thing, you know, that I tell all my students and all the people that work under me on my teams is, you know, read all the data sheets like multiple times. So if you have a circuit that you are working on uh, that's around a commercial component or chip, um, pull up the data sheet and read that once or read it again. And when you think you've read it enough times, read it again once more, because that data sheet is going to give you a lot of information about how the circuit's going to work, what are its absolute maximum characteristics, uh, and it'll help you troubleshoot things later on down the line. Um, and then just some personal acknowledgments here. So these are all the Hoop Pro Step 1 team members across the electronics, hardware, software, um, the whole team. Uh, and then highlighted here, I've um, special thank you to Kylie Ango and Luis Yon. They're the undergrads that are on my team. Um, they did great work uh, with me on, uh, you know, getting the schematics up, uh, triple checking all of my work. Uh, and um, what else uh, am I forgetting? Uh, and also working with other members of the team to develop other electronics as well. Uh, and then also a special shout out to uh, Dr. Samantha Kenyon, um, who is the faculty advisor for my team specifically. Uh, her knowledge on just general electronics development uh, for the space environment was really invaluable for this project. And I don't think we could have done, I don't think I, I don't think we could have done this uh, work without her. So, and yeah, I'm just going to open it up to questions now. So thanks for listening. <laughs> small round of applause, yeah. Awesome. So yeah, anybody who got you know, can, and folks out there, feel free to chime in and um, ask any questions here for, for Richard. Well, I'll ask from in the room here. Yeah. Uh, what sort of temperature variation are you expecting? So for TVAC testing, we did plus 60 degrees Celsius and minus 10 degrees Celsius. Um, but for the space environment, uh, I think someone from uh, the aerospace team could correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we're going to see um, plus and minus temperature variations of 100 degrees Celsius, unless uh, I think Gustavo might correct me on that, uh, that number. Um, but that's what we were looking at. So we just triple check the data sheets to make sure that like, okay, these components either have flown in space uh, or uh, their operating ranges are, um, or well meet like the requirements for like, you know, the temperature swings that we're gonna see on orbit. Um, so. Are there any measures you take because temperature is excessive under too hot? Yeah, so there are, so there are uh, measures that we do take. Um, so one is just sourcing components uh, and making sure that, so it's actually reading the data sheet and looking at like the uh, actual temperature ratings. Um, so they'll actually have that listed as the absolute maximum characteristics. Uh, now it's not completely accurate because as you get closer and closer to those upper and upper limits, the probability of like that component failing goes up. Um, and that's just something you kind of learn from experience. Uh, so we took that into account as well. Uh, and there are ways on a spacecraft where you can actually get the temperature swing down pretty low, uh, using thermal foil heaters or some sort of, um, passive heating control system, um, to make sure that it never exceeds like a certain range uh, for the temperature swing. So. I have a question. Yes. <clears throat> so looking at looking further down the line in the future, um, how do you see uh, this project becoming modular enough for a Virginia Tech payload control module in future spacecraft missions? Yeah, so already like most of the work has already been done. Um, so the beauty of this board is that because, you know, we have what I call a complete source of truth, which is that we have everything from schematic capture done to the actual assembly of the board um, and, te and test of it. 
uh, we can just take the schematics and extend it out to other boards. Um, so like we could redesign the payload control module to suit uh, other missions. Uh, we could also extend it out to do other capabilities like act as an, its own onboard controller for a mission um, or a power supply or even a radio uh, if you had the RF electronics to it. Um, so that was kind of the grand vision of this whole process was basically just to get down the design, build and test um, of just this one electronic component um, so that this way uh, we can extend it out to other missions and other applications for um, space APT missions. Good question. A following question, uh, what would be the uh, cost benefit between uh, acquiring a uh, onboard computer commercially off the shelf and, and the cost of uh, manufacturing one of these here at Virginia? Yeah, so the cost of manufacturing uh, actually this board, and this is like probably the overall cost of development, I want to say it was like 400 bucks um, in total. Uh, whereas if you were to go and buy an onboard controller uh, from a cube, from a commercial CubeSat company, it's probably they're probably going to charge you 10 grand just for that one part. Uh, so if you're going through and you're building a whole bus, um, right, the total cost of that is going to be like 50, 60K, which is like a car. And for a mission, for a satellite mission whose lifetime is only nine days in a low uh, altitude orbit, that's just insane from a systems engineering or a pragmatic perspective. Um, but by leveraging some of the facilities that we have here at TAC to actually design and develop these electronics, uh, we've actually gotten the cost down substantially. Um, and uh, that's been the, the big thing. So the hope is, is that not only will this, will this component serve as like a, a foundation for future electronics projects, it's going to try and save money for the program overall uh, to try and develop the stuff in-house. So. Good job. Thank you. <laughs> um, so there's a question from, from myself. Um, you mentioned this was going to fly in the like 200 to 300 kilometer. Yeah. Have you thought um, things on, what is it called, like spacecraft charging or things like that? Because you'll be basically flying around in the ionosphere, at least yeah. the upper upper levels of it. So it won't be supercharged. You're not like the highest yeah, yeah, charge yeah. of it, but it's not going to be, you know, nothing kind of thing. Yeah. So for the uh, spacecraft charge uh, on it, um, I mean, so that's actually a good question because uh, that's something that me and the team haven't thought a whole lot about. Uh, we also did a lot of research with like, you know, a, a lot of like our electronics development and a risk mitigation for like, you know, things, things we're going to screw up, which is the component selection and just trying to select components that we know uh, worked really well in the space environment or had flown there in the past uh, to try and, and mitigate those issues. Uh, but for the charge, uh, I, don't, I don't think I have a, a good answer for that. I know. <laughs> um, otherwise, to um, you, you haven't really touched anything on like a power budget or anything like that. But right. I yeah. So the, the goal for this board is to actually uh, uh, run it under test. Uh, so that's basically to hook it up to a power supply. Um, the complication with like, you know, power budgets is that, uh, in my view, and this is from my experience from my undergraduate satellite team. Uh, is that they're kind of an oversimplification um, just because that, you know, for like a processor board, for example, it's power draw is going to vary depending on what operating modes you have, right? Uh, so just a basic turning on when it's not running any of the electronics is going to be like, it's going to have a current draw of 0 0.00, no, 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 0.5. Forget the number from the power supply. Um, but the goal instead is to uh, have a list of like our operating modes for the spacecraft and then hook this up under a power supply and then just test each of those operating modes, see what the overall power is, and then just go and write a program to actually calculate like, oh, what's the power gonna look like with respect to time here? And then this way we can actually do like power balancing um, where we can go to our aerospace engineers and say, okay, this is how we should probably modify the concept of operations here uh, to make sure that we don't deplete the ba batteries all the way. Um, and so that, that was kind of the goal of developing our Another good re reason for developing your own electronics is that you kind of get that that source of truth. Um, usually, companies uh, will provide just um, basically like whatever the max power draw is, which is good for a power budget. Uh, but you want to see like what the power the power draw is going to change over time uh, as the spacecraft gets used. So, yeah, I've I've looked at some things and I, I don't 
don't know if there's a word for it. Maybe Gustavo knows about doing what you're mentioning or what you're mentioning about like power analysis. Yeah, more like a power analysis, maybe yeah. about doing that. It's not like a power. I, I sometimes still even think about it as a power budget, saying it's yeah. But power budget's usually a, a way to say it's just the maximum or yeah. It's like it's a, a worst yeah. So it's a worst case scenario. Yeah. Um. I mean, the thing from my uh, experience that kills the spacecraft is you either uh you either overcharge the battery or you deplete the battery all the way to zero um so you have to have like your mitigation strategy where you say okay if we're at 20 percent state of charge uh i'm going to turn off uh, certain payload electronics uh just so that way i can get myself back up to 50 60 percent state of charge and then i can resume normal mission operations mm -hmm. um yeah, and so I think the power balancing is going to get handled by the avionics software, uh, and the avionics is just going to tell the payload control module, like, hey, I need you to shut off um, payload one, payload two, payload three, because we're not going to have enough power uh, to get through the whole mission lifetime. So, okay. yeah. Yeah, and there's a sort of deeper question, too. You mentioned about having the LEDs on there, and um, I have not thought about this but leds versus like having a just as a test point right I know yeah exactly because you know it's a um are, are the leds actually on if they're on in space where nobody's going to see them kind of yeah thing. so, so it mean, works good for on here but yeah, yeah so this yeah so this board um you know it's just like you know the first ground prototype uh mm -hmm. right because you have all these test points and everything mm -hmm. um what me and my team are going to do is that so like the leds for example we can just leave unpopulated on the board when we go and fly it up in the space um we just wanted to like for our sake like when we plug it in on the bench it's like okay are we are we actually getting what we're supposed to see here yeah. um as sort of as like a visual check yeah. uh but yeah it was more of one of those things i hadn't thought of before but uh, it's uh it's like the, if a tree falls in the woods like yeah right? exactly it's like leds it's 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 actually an led yeah so the nice thing that we learned from like, you know, kind of doing this project is uh, you can go through and you can design a board um, and have it have all sorts of footprints on it. And then depending on what functionality you want, you can leave off those components or solder them on uh, in your assembly process if you wanted to. Um, so like, uh, I know that recently this past week, the team wanted uh, an actual like a uh, button reset switch uh, to reset the board. Um, but my team didn't include that because, well, I mean, it's, it's going to go in the space environment. Nobody's yeah, going to be there and press the button. Right now. Um, but just having that book right there, electrically wired, so that in the event if you wanted to, you just attach one, have it pressed, and then when you're ready to move on to the final flight version, you just take it off. All right. Other, other more uh, technical questions or things like that? Yeah. Um, there's one other one that I'll ask that you haven't kind of because you brought up the testing part of it. Yeah. Um, are you looking for uh, is uh, forward towards um, you know like outgassing and then vibration and that such too? Yeah. With this, I guess that's I'm I'm assuming so. You just kind of maybe like glossed over that of. Yeah. So for the, is, uh, I guess it more so is that upcoming in the testing for us? Yeah, that's going to be upcoming in the testing. Uh, so the first TB T back test that we did was just going to be to validate that, A, we can get the electronics board uh, working with the deployment mechanism in the TVAC, uh, testing to see if the deployment mechanism works in a TVAC. Um, this is kind of like what I sort of touched on before, which is the idea of sequential testing. Mm -hmm. If you go through and you just build the whole thing and then you turn it on uh, and you get like a million sources of error, it's impossible to figure out where it came from what yeah. and troubleshooting. Um, so we wanted to make sure the deployment mechanism worked in a TVAC uh, before we put the electronics in. Our net upcoming TVAC is going to be uh, to take the revision three of this board uh, and stick it all together um, and in the TVAC to see what's going to work, what's not going to work. Uh, and then the vibrations testing, I believe, we hand off to Wallace Flight Facility for testing. Um, I mean, with the components and everything on the board, I think we can actually pass uh, vibrations testing since the solder connections are actually pretty reliable. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then for outgassing, again, that's just our TVAC uh, to see, like, okay, how is our PCB actually handling these components? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I was going to say, you didn't explicitly mention it. Oh, yeah, 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 you brought yeah, up yeah, testing, yeah. you didn't bring up, like, the space part. I was yeah. like, well, just to bring it up in general. Yeah. So I have, uh, just to elaborate a little further there. Um, yeah. So how easy is, Richard, to put, like, uh, more than one board ready 
uh, in a bench and then give to students or give to like a future mission developer to yeah. get used to that and then uh, set up their experiments, maybe do some uh, electrical consumption, uh, power consumption uh, uh, analysis on the bench, you know, like how easy is this board to do all that for the near future? Yeah, so it's actually really easy to do um, because we have all the power outputs going to the back PC-104 connector. So we tell you where exactly like, hey, five volts and 3.3 volts and battery bus voltage is on there. All you have to do is just attach some wires to it and then just hook it up to a power supply and lab. Um, and then in terms of getting like, uh, so like I consider this to be the engineering model uh, for the board. Um, so for getting like engineering models of this guy out, uh, it's actually uh, fairly easy. Um, because highlighting, you know, noting that manufacturing process there before, I just use a stencil printer and a refill oven. Uh, I can actually turn around one of these boards in about uh, four hours just in the lab. Um, and then, of course, I could probably leave and come back to it. Uh, so if, you know, teams need multiple boards, um, or, you know, if uh, somebody from software needed a version of the board and then someone from, uh, you know, like our customer needed a version of the board, uh, we can get those out fairly quickly. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. And uh, and you you mentioned also that you have all these connections sort out like CAN, I C, UART, yeah. it's all available, right? Yeah, I mean the uh, the STM thirty two um, is actually a pretty robust um, like processor overall. It has like a lot of different channels for SPI, I C, UART, USB two point uh, really what you could ask for. So in terms of the PCB, it's just developing. Um, actually routing those traces to a Pico blade connector uh, for an actual output. So users just decide, okay, what, or the users being like, you know, um, people overall for the mission decide what interfaces that they need for, to support their payloads. Uh, and then you just draw those out on the PCB. Thank you. Yeah. I love these questions. Like, these are great. <laughs> Any any other questions? Sorry, I've not been good on monitoring. Like, if anybody's raising their hand or whatnot. Oh yeah, that's like, great. I forgot we have a we have a chat function. Yeah. So going going once or going twice. See if you can find the mute button. Sometimes my Zoom controls have been a little tricky here. <laughs> Anything else from? You know, say you could be extra treat if you're here. Not only cookies, but then to not have to find the mute button. <laughs> um, well, thanks everybody for joining. Um, uh, we'll conclude here for now. And we've got a couple of these coming up. Uh, I think four to five of them uh, presentations on the uh, boot pro set. Uh, we'll have one next week. I forget uh, who's the presenter. Do you remember Rob? Uh, yeah. Uh, or wait, Rob. Uh, I think it's uh, Derek is going to be Derek. Presenting. Yes. Yeah, Derek will present, um, I think, sort of an update. So we'll uh, hear from him. And um, yeah, then uh, the 5th, October 5th, which is in three weeks from now, we'll have the, a new um, mechanical engineering professor uh, presenting kind of on um, what, their, what, what their research is. So Oh, excellent. Yeah, so we'll see, see that. So. But thanks, everybody, for joining for now. And uh, we'll see you uh, this time next week.